Okay, thanks very much, guys. Uh, so, um, last talk, I hope you had a great day. I definitely had. So, this talk is called, well, Fresh from the Oven in uh, multiple meanings. You're going to see the other meanings, but one of the meanings is uh, the demo that I'll be showing was on a snapshot that I was publishing like a minute ago. So, it's really fresh. Um, but that's actually what I want to talk about. So if Akka is this awesome fighter jet from Macros, that's a futuristic series, but that's, yeah, that's just Akka. It's awesome, right? But it's even more awesome if a fighter plane suddenly has legs and is a mech. So this is where um, I kind of visualize these new modules and how they will change Akka itself. So who am I? I'm Conrad. I work at TypeSafe. I also organize a bunch of stuff in Krakow, including the Geekon conference. I hope you heard about it. You're invited in May, of course. But yeah, I just want to have a little bit of uh, information about you guys. Uh, who's using Akka? Like, hands up. Okay, do we have people who have never seen Akka before? That's perfectly fine, just raise your hand. Okay. Um, I just need to know how much I need to explain. Okay, so. Everything I'm going to show here in this talk is completely experimental or not even published or, um, well, it can be completely different by the time we publish it. So be aware of that. That's what I mean with fresh from the oven. So the agenda is like that. So we're going to talk about ACA, what it is, and what the new unreleased experimental modules um, bring to the table. And most of it, you'll notice, is types. There's going to be more types everywhere, basically. So. Uh, let's talk about ACA actors, which, yes, they are untyped. So why are they untyped? I mean, there's a number of reasons, but let's define what an actor is. But just so we, everybody has the same understanding, an actor is only three things. It can send messages, so it can only communicate using messaging, it can create other actors, and it can change its behavior based on some mes message it received. Especially the last one is super important, and, and we'll talk about um, how it um, shapes the APIs we expose in ACA. So why is it untyped? Well, truth be told, very much inspired by Erlang. ACA was created by Jonas a few years ago. That's also untyped, right? And in fact, there were multiple uh, attempts of adding types to Erlang to kind of make this more usable, user-friendly. Well, most of them were complete, complete, just abandoned. And also, we kind of, in Scala at least, in Java now we have some helpers for that, but we have pattern matching, and it doesn't make it as painful as it um, maybe should be. So, um, let's talk about archetyped. It's uh, mostly a module developed uh, by Roland Kuhn, currently tech lead of the ACA project, and is it, this is not the typed actors module, right? Don't confuse those two things. So the old typed actors uh, were never really designed to be kind of the core of ACA. It's just a bridge, so those Java, well, I don't want to um, put it this way. People who like a nice um, in Java interface were, wouldn't be too afraid to cross over to ACA land. I mean, you can just expose an interface, and it's a bridge I into the actor land, right? It's, it's not a core abstraction. It's more like a helper, if you want to see it this way. Uh, so how they work is, um, by reflection, we, we look at the signature, and then we can basically spin the message inside and relay the message over. So this is really, really bad in a number of ways. So one of the big, biggest pain points here is when you do the square now and you expect an int, well, this is a blocking call suddenly, right? Because there's no way you, you can just get an int immediately because there's communication involved. So what is all right is APIs that would expose a future here, right? So you can in, in the future map over it and then do stuff. But it, it makes it so easy to do the wrong thing, right? I mean, you just write an API and you expect it to work. You have no idea about actors. So you write what you would expect in Java land, so this guy, and it's just the wrong thing. So we don't want to encourage people to use it. And also, all this reflection stuff, etc. it has a huge overhead. It's like 10 times slower because we need to spin stuff um, during runtime. And you lose the become, right? Do people know uh, what become is in an actor? So become is, if you have your function, it defines your behavior. You can say become another function, and that is your new, new behavior. 
You can't really do this because you expose, expose this interface and, well, that's what you exposed. So, um, after a few failed attempts, including the typed channels projects, which um, was developed for a while and then just stashed because it wasn't good enough, the current approach um, that we'll be shipping with ACA 2.4 as an experimental module is ACA typed. And let's see how it compares to the current actors. And like I said, most of this work is uh, Roland Kuhn. Okay, so this is a plain old actor. You have a receive method, you extend an actor, and you can do stuff with the message, right? Uh, this is how you start them. You have an actor system, and then you can start new actors. And this is how you send a message. Oh, sorry, this should be greeter, greet, right? Um, the important thing is, well, the actor is not typed, the actor system is not typed, and you can send any message to the guy, right? This is the pain point that people um, were stumbling we well, having problems with because it's not really helpful if you have an actor ref, you don't know which protocol it can understand, right? So, in ACA types, um, first thing, the actor trait, um, currently at least, is gone. So what we talk about in ACA typed is more just behaviors. And that's the part where you see total here. And I'm going to explain these um, in a slide or two maybe. But generally speaking, this means it's a total function. So my behavior is, is defined by a total function. So it can understand all parts of this protocol. It's, it's not a case. So now we have behaviors, and they are typed, right? So you can be a behavior of, I don't know, buying a car protocol, something like that. Uh, then you just implement it. And because we know this is the greet protocol, the message will be a subclass of the greet, right? It can be just a greet. Um, OK, then the behavior is actually the receive. So we kind of extracted the core of what is an actor. It, it's, its behavior is the most important thing about an actor, right? So this is now the core concept. So instead of having a receive block, the, the, the behavior is the receive block. And now to the groundbreaking changes. So as you might have noticed here, there is no sender. So sender has led to, to multiple problems for, for people in production because, as you may or may not know, it's implemented as a um, variable, as in mutable state, right? So if you close over it in the future, that's one of the biggest, I mean, wrongdoings you can do in Akai. You close over the sender, and it's actually the wrong person. You're replying to the wrong person because by the time the future triggers, the sender is different. So this has been a known problem, and we're fixing it in ACA typed by just not having the sender. OK, what does that mean? That means that in the protocols, you will have to include the, if you want me to reply to you, you need to put in a actor ref where I'm supposed to reply to. Uh, may sound scary. It's more explicit, right? First, oh my god, I have to do more work. First, one more field in my message. But actually, when you think about it, it also makes things explicit in terms of is it a protocol that is only intended to be one way, or is it a protocol that I expect people to re reply to me, right? So even by looking at the message, you have now more information how the protocol is working. So I think it's a good thing. Um, yeah, so like I said, you have a reply to, and first time we see an actor ref over here, yes, the actor ref is also typed with the protocol it understands. Um, what else is to say about that one? So internally, there's an interesting um, change that this allows us to do, because when we, when we now in ACA ship a message, what we do is we create an envelope, we put your message in, and we put in the sender, and then we store this envelope and ship it around, right? So we do this transparently for you, exactly what you could have done here manually. There's an interesting cost associated with that, because, I mean, if you have a one-way protocol, we create this envelope, even though we don't need to, because you never use this actor ref to reply to the guy. And allocating objects, um, well, actually, when you talk about high-performance stuff, it costs time. So there's an interesting side effect that um, this will help a little bit with performance, because we can throw out envelope out, out of the window. Yeah, interesting side effect. Uh, actor ref has a type. That's an interesting one. So, um, who of you has used the finite state machines DSL? Hands up, please. 
Okay, so half of a room maybe. So the finite state machines uh, DSL in ACA is something that helps you, well, model state machines, right? What, what, what it looks like is at the end of a block, you basically say, am I staying in the same behavior or am I going to be a different behavior by the time I receive the next message? Right, so do a transition from a state to another state. What we do, in, um, well, also internally when we develop ACA things, turns out that become is, become is like slapping on a become functionality onto something that should have been a finite state machine from the beginning. B because it's so nice to express things explicitly to just have these different states and transition between them. And we often find that it would be very much better to encourage people to model things as finite state machines because that encourages thinking in terms of protocols and in what state can I do what. So in ACA typed, what we do is we kind of make it explicit. Explicit and we force it to uh, all users of the API. So in here, because I want to stay in the same behavior, uh, there's a special object you can return. Um, it's called same. And there's also different ones um, called unhandled, if you, for example, want to signal to, to Akka that this message was unhandled, or that you want to stop yourself, instead of context stop self, uh, you can now just return the behavior of, yeah, I'm stopping myself. So it's also more consistent if you think about it. Instead of just calling a method somewhere in the middle of a flow, you're assigning the next behavior, which is being stopped. Uh, one slide I skipped over here. Well, yes, we kind of force you to do this, but if you have an actor that is not a state machine, I mean, he only has one state, there's a different uh, behavior factory that is called static. So you're a static behavior, you're, you do basically don't have the become functionality. Uh, this would allow you to not write this same here, right? Because you're staying in the same behavior always. Okay, now, Interesting thing about the actor system, so I hope you know that one of the biggest advantages and um, good things about ACA is its supervision hi hierarchy, right? But you have nested actors and if a guy on the bottom blows up, the guy a bit higher up can decide what are we doing now? Um, I mean, is this fatal or is this not fatal? Can I restart? Can I notify someone, etc. And we usually encourage people to take this concept and take it right to the top of the application, that you should have my application actor, and he's basically the one who decides, are we killing the app, or can we continue running, or can we, can we do something? So encouraging, of course, helps, but enforcing with types is even better. So what we do here is, when you create an actor system, you create the uh, su supervisor that is at the exact top of the actor hierarchy. So this is the guy who is responsible who is the end of the world for this actor system. This allows, well, this forces people, developers, to think more about supervision. Sometimes you maybe don't remember about it, you ignore it until things go wrong. Now at least you have a small reminder. Okay, I talked about behaviors, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, they all do the same thing, but they expose different functionalities. So static and, and total are the ones that are just the usual receive. Uh, partial is the same, but it's a partial function inside there. And then you have the full ones. So because you don't really have a context, right? When you look at this guy, I mean, the message comes in here, was the actor context, right? But you need the actor context because you need to call things like um, create a child actor, that kind of things, right? Or do a selection or schedule a timeout. So you need a context. But no, not all actors do need a context. So if you do need the full power, then use the full behavior. Uh, the full behavior looks like this. So then, before we deliver the message to you, we wrap it in the, in the message or signal. So signal is for um, internal events, like uh, supervision events, and um, yeah, post pre-stop conditions, that kind of stuff. Everything is now modeled as messages instead of having mostly messages and then pre-start, uh, pre pre-restart would be in the normal ACA methods that you override, right? So here it's all stuff.
stuffed in, into the messaging paradigm. So it's a bit more consistent. And this is the context you can use to spawn. Uh, we use the spawn word to differentiate the untyped actors from the typed actors. So spawn is the typed ones, actor of, which you all know, is for the untyped ones. And this is a super interesting thing. So because we now have this top-level concept, the concept in Akka is the behavior, we can do interesting things that, well, you could, of course, just do the same thing with uh, functions. Um, just inside your receive, you would call two methods, for example, right? And so basically, didn't end. I want to do this thing and this thing. But with behaviors, because they are such top-level concepts now, we, we can expose combinators that take two behaviors or more. And then, for example, the end combinator applies the message to both behaviors. And you can easily see how this would be interesting for stuff like logging, right? Because I want to deliver to the logging behavior and I want to deliver to my logic behavior, right? Or, or the or combinator, which is uh, the same as you would do with apply or else, right? So we still have the usual pattern of or else, or else in receives. And now the most important, most um, problematic thing, I would say, maybe, because we were talking about how become is so cu crucial, right? But if I just say I am this um, greet protocol, it's, well, that's something, but it's not giving me the full power of becoming a different protocol. Maybe my protocol is um, initializing something, right? And I can only get the initialized message. But then I want to expose to people my other actor ref, which is now initialized, and I'm ready to take work, right? So you can use that to uh, these narrow and widen. Well, widen isn't always safe, right? But narrow is if you have my protocol, and then you have uh, initializing is a subclass, and running is another subclass, then you can narrow your protocol down to now I'm initialized, and I'm only taking the initialized messages. Okay, so that's a summary of archetyped. If you have any questions, maybe grab me afterwards, because it's getting a bit short on time. So well, that's my reaction, at least. But I hope you like it. And if you guys have any feedback, just shoot uh, any questions during the party or take a look at it. This is merged on the master branch. Uh, on the master branch of Akka, so you can check it out. It's not released yet. We didn't do a release of the 2.4 version yet, but it's there and you can check it out. Yeah. Okay. Now the other part, and we're right through the middle of the talk, so I think I'm going to make it. So that's reactive streams and Akka streams. So hands up who has seen reactive streams, heard about them. Okay. Very trendy recently, right? Okay. So what reactive streams are is reactive streams are the initiative and the SPI. It's a common set of interfaces that multiple people implement, including the Rx guys, the Vertex guys, and us. So um, there's a web page, and you can check out the artifacts and the TCK if you want to write your, your, own, uh, own, your own implementation. Then you can check it and check out these artifacts, and there's a TCK that verifies that you're actually doing what the spec says you should be doing. So sometimes when when some groups publish um, protocols or specifications, they don't come with a TCK, and then everybody implements it slightly differently, and then they are incompatible. So we try to avoid that by doing a TCK that actually checks the behavior. Uh, so these are some of the people who implemented this. Um, most notably, the Rx guys, right? Ben Christensen and Victor Klang from our side uh, basically cooperated and thought of creating this API so everybody can collaborate on it. So what is, what is the goals of this project? It's two goals, actually. One goal is to be able to cooperate. If I have a stream, that I, a stream of data that I created in Akka, and, well, I have some library that it's using, I don't know, Reactor, I want to be able to connect these two streams together without doing a, every time I do this, I have to write a manual conversion thing. So if everybody underneath is using the same protocols and the same types, we can just stick, in, stick them together. So that's one goal, interoperability between those uh, implementations. And the other goal is back pressure. So what is back pressure? Who knows what, is, what the back pressure is? Okay, half the room. So let's, let's quickly go over. So 
in any kind of system that's queue-based, basically, um, there's a queue, and if this guy is very slow, but this guy is very fast, you can run into a situation that basically you overflow his buffer. Well, so what do you do then? Well, there's a few things you can do. One thing is drop the messages, and that's actually what many, many implementations do. You just drop the messages and then require the publisher to send those again. And this is very scary for application, I don't know, application level developers sometimes because, what, I need to think about re-delivery? Shouldn't it just deliver magically? Well, it turns out no, and turns out many protocols do need this re-delivery thing, especially once you hit the network, you need re-delivery, no way around it, to be safe at least. I mean, with UDP, you don't care, perhaps. Okay, so what you can do uh, another way, you, you can notice that, oh my god, my buffer is almost blowing up, and until you have memory, you can maybe make a bigger buffer. Well, but then at some point, you're going to be out of memory, right? So if you claim, but I have unbounded buffers, well, you may have unbounded buffers, but your VM doesn't have unbounded memory, right? So there's always some bound on the queue that you have. So the situation of, oh, but, but I have a big queue, is not really solving the problem. So um, as we know, the problem is only really apparent when the publisher is faster than the subscriber, right? If the subscriber is faster than the publisher, well, I will have a pretty empty queue, but that's not a problem. I can just keep operating. So. We want to have some protocol that is able to switch between these two modes dynamically. Because slowing down the publisher involves some communication, and some communication introduces some delays, right? And more work for the subscriber. So the protocol that Reactive Streams define is basically an extension of pull-based protocols. So in pull-based protocols, you would say, give me a message, and the guy gives me a message. And then you say again, give me a message and the guy gives you a message. So that's what we understand with pull-based protocols here. But in Reactive Streams, what we do is we can say, okay, I'm ready to receive three messages. And then you don't need to talk with the guy again unless he depletes your demand. The number here is called demand in our terminology. And he can also accumulate this demand. So if you say demand three, demand six, then he has nine, and you don't need to communicate with him again until he depletes the demand. The interesting thing is that because you are kind of controlling the number you're sending over, it can always be safe because if you have a bounded buffer, I can only hold 10 elements, for example, you can always say safely that I'm ready to receive 10 elements because you have a buffer ready for 10 elements and you will not want any more elements than that. So that's a safe way to do this. And because we do this with this number, we allow for pipelining. So the guy is then able to deliver um, focus on you. If it's a threat, it um, gets some CPU time, delivers five messages to you because it had more than five demand, and then it can go to sleep and do the same again once it gets more demand. So performance-wise, it's, like I said, this good trade-off between, yes, there is some communication, but if the subscriber is faster than the publisher, it's not really an issue because he will be giving more demand than the slow publisher is depleting. So you never really block the publisher. Okay. And if you really want to, you can opt out of the back pressure thing. Um, not really recommended, but you can, right? If, if you know the source is really slow and I don't want to spend time uh, communicating with it, you can just signal, um, basically turn off the protocol by doing this. Totally not recommended, but sometimes you may have situations where you really know what you're doing. This brings us to ACA streams. So ACA streams are our implementation of this. And there's a few concepts I want to show you. Um, but mostly I want to show you guys how this back pressure thing actually works and what it's doing for you, like where it is helping. And because one, one, if you worked in a system that was completely overloaded, then you get a feel for it. Oh man, uh, maybe I need this. But if you weren't in a, such a situation, I don't know about your careers and what projects you're working on, then Maybe it sounds like, yeah, why, why do I need this? So we'll talk about this, and there's a few API examples. So API examples first, or maybe no, first the demo. 
I know I have not much time, but I think we'll make it. So, um, code-wise, you didn't yet see any of uh, on y any of uh, DSL, but basically what we do is we have a yeah actor system, of course, but so because it's actor-based, and then we have a flow materializer, whereas flow is our stream thing, right? Uh, so the flow materializer is someone that takes a flow description. I'm going to show that in a second, and makes it run. It materializes the thing. So here I have a flow uh, that is acting to be slow. Without going into the details, it basically progresses one step at one second. Right? So it's acting like a slow computation. When I stuff this into ACA HTTP, which is also a new streams-based module, here on line 42, I basically start the server and for each connection, I'm going to route it through the routing DSL, which you may um, well recognize from Spray. So Spray is becoming a okay, HTTP with the uh, added functionality of line 37. So if you have a request, the data bytes now are a source, so they are a stream of bytes. And this is really important because you normally, um, because Spray was fully actor messaging based, so doing any kind of streaming was really awkward because, I mean, you can't fit a 4 gig file in a message, so you have to chunk it up and handle the chunking manually. But with a stream interface, I mean, you just say, yeah, it's a stream of bytes. I don't care how big it is, right? You can just stream it through your system, store it maybe on a local file, or do something else with it, right? So this is the, the, the change from Spray to HTTP that you can have these stream-based abstractions. And I go via this F flow, which is this slow guy, right? So let's see how this actually works. So um, the, red, the red windows are the slow server, and the green window is um, exactly the same, but it's not delaying one second, it's delaying, yeah, a millisecond. Maybe. Okay. So, and then I curl a very big file to it, and I want you guys to look at the current speed. It's right here on the on the right. Okay, so it's you know, 100k, something like that. Oh, and now it dropped to its bytes, right? It's not very fast. So when I do the same without with the slow processing of the data, uh, the speed will not drop. It will just continue going at a nice nice rate. So what this actually means, I mean, what I'm trying to show you guys here is that if your logic because let's assume I have some complex logic doing stuff with this data. If your logic can't keep up with processing the data, you're able to slow down whoever is uploading the file and not even get it into your memory because you're not reading from the socket because you won't be able to process it. So this is the back pressure and it's totally built in for you because Akka Streams handles the reactive streams protocol and we basically are end-to-end -end from the TCP socket to user land. This is all back pressured. So you won't end up with a situation where you thread up read a gigs of data and it's in memory, but you can't really do anything with it. So that kind of situations. But now, a few minutes to look at the API. I know I'm short of ti on time. So what we have is flows, sources, and sinks. And these are very distinct. So if you know uh, RxJava, in RxJava everything is an observable. Um, we have separated those and something where you put data in is a sync, something where the data starts flowing from is a source. But they expose the same APIs, right? And inside you, you can have an operation, of course. I mean, this looks like any kind of collection or stream library that is out there. So what we do is um, we can run to a sync, or there's a little bit of convenience methods, right? Nothing unexpected, and there's a number of syncs and sources that you can work with. Um, notably missing a file source in sync, but that should be in, in the next release. Okay, and of course, all the combinators that you would expect, including some that are very specific to streaming back pressure applications. So I specifically want to talk about Conflate. So Let's think about this back pressure thing. Um, let's just say you have a average mark stock price something, and the downstream wants to get 
the latest stock price all the time, right? But maybe it's not fast enough to consume really as, as fast as you can produce the stock price. So then you can introduce a element that basically will aggregate, well, here I'm just summing, but imagine you, you, you um, keep uh, an average and then you have a running average, basically, right? Uh, then you can have an element that keeps making these small adjustments, so ma many elements come from the upstream, but the downstream is not yet ready to consume it, so you will keep making a better informed decision, for example, inside the conflate. Right? And then if the downstream is ready to consume it, it will signal demand, and then it gets, well, uh, this adjusted number, but it's one and not 3,000 pending messages. Right? So it's that kind of things that uh, we are able to do with streaming. And of course, so streams of streams, etc. Um, I know I'm over time, so I'm just going to highlight the, the big difference from other libraries that uh, are in the streaming space. So we, we opted to have a very, very explicit graph API. So in many, in many libraries that, um, well, at least up until now, you would say, yeah, this looks like Rx, or this looks like uh, Scalding. Yeah, it does. But the one difference that we have is with being very explicit about graphs. So when you have anything more complex, we model it as a graph because it has fan out operations, it has fan in operations, maybe you need to fan out to a file and to a socket and to some actor and do some logging. It gets complicated. In the real world, just a linear thing. Very, very popular case, but not the only case. So we made this graph DSL to make uh, these kinds of operations more nice to, to read at least. And yeah, I don't want to go over everything. We basically, what I'm saying here is that you have a uh, flow graph and we enable you to expose a shape. So a shape is something that you want to have nice names in your application, right? So you want to connect my work input Q with some other input, right? You don't want to connect input one to input two. It's boring. We could generate names, but they would be crap because it's not, not we are not your domain, right? So what we allow is to, you model some, some computation graph, and then you expose whatever, in whatever domain it makes sense, uh, these ports of your graph. So in this example, it's a work balancer, so it's a work uh, jobs in and priority jobs in, and you can imag Im imagine what it's doing. It tries to take uh, jobs from the priority queue first, or from the other queue. And then when you expose it, using it becomes really simple because you just give someone this graph, they don't have to care at all how it's implemented, but just looking by the names of these inputs, they can figure out what it's doing, right? So it's geared towards more complex things than just this linear, it's, it's not boring, but it's simple. Linear things are very simple, and sometimes it's just not enough, we thought. We have an interesting user of this stuff, the, the biggest, um, well, biggest internal, because first clients using this, even though it's pre-experimental, don't, don't use this on production, people are using it and being rather happy. But we re really look at our internal use case, which is ArcHTTP currently. Uh, so this is the outgoing connection. So y you might think, yeah, it's just bytes going out and bytes going in. This is modeling a TCP connection. But actually, Sometimes there's events in the TCP connection that will cancel the flow, right? You, you shut down the connection, so you don't want to deliver this to the user land because he has no idea what to do with that. We own the socket over here. So if a, re if a request such like that comes in, we have here it's a fan out operation that basically terminates the flow both ways. You shut down the, the, the stream. So it turns out these graphs are very, very everywhere. Let's put it this way, maybe. Um, yeah. So, like I said, it's a, a pros it's an idea bigger than just the Scala ecosystem, because we're reaching like JDK-wide, maybe open JDK-wide. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see multiple libraries pop up and maybe provide adapters to databases and different things or services based on these streams. Um, 
were interoperable with all these libraries that I mentioned. Um, and yeah, of course, I think our implementation is the best, but everybody will be saying that about their implementation. So yeah, I want to wrap up now. So the future is typed. There's really interesting stuff going uh, to be in the future releases. And even though I can't give any guarantees, but you guys will ask me anyway, well, of course, the answer is when, when is it going, going to be done? The answer is when it's done, in the usual type safe way. But um, I do have some milestones. If you want to track this, we do want to get user feedback. So here's a few dates you can look at. So reactive streams were uh, in their last release candidate yesterday. So we expect a few weeks for it to basically everybody to test the latest TCK. And then we can um, move on with the 1.0 release. Aka Streams is entering its release candidate cycle. So while um, we don't advertise it for production readiness yet, the API will not change a lot. It will change. It will change, but it will not change a lot. Uh, if you've been tracking the recent releases, every two weeks would be a completely different API. So those times are gone now. And Aka HTTP, not release candidate yet. It's still in milestone mode, but that's because it's depending on Aka Streams. Um, and like I said, Aka type is already merged. You can play around with it, but there isn't an actual release yet. So you have to release locally if you want to see it. I don't know if we have time for questions. Maybe just grab me outside or something. One question. We do have one question. Who is brave? Yes, that's a wonderful question. And the answer is the same way you can do in the finite state machines DSL, uh, which I didn't show actually, but I can show you what I mean. Uh, we need someone who's becoming. No, we don't have such a guy. But um, because it's an, like an FSM, you designate the next behavior. So if you want to assign stuff, well, either you can have. Um, well, I think I would do this. You can become, there's going to be a new behavior, and maybe the new behavior is uh, my, this, this behavior, just copy, and you can have variables in the behavior, right? So you can immutably create a new behavior for the kind of next step, right? You don't need uh, vars. You can just become the new state, if you know what I'm getting at. Okay. That was the last question. So thank you very much. I think there's an after party. Thank you. Big applause.